evening. I can see some of you are still busy with checking the WhatsApp messages on your phones. What if I tell you, in the future, you might not even have to hold your phone in your hand to do this. If you had the choice, would you implant your smartphone into your head? Let us do a thought experiment and try to imagine what it would be like if we lived in a world where this would be possible. In that world, you could access all the functions of your phone using your thoughts. Everything that you usually see on the screen would be displayed into your visual space. Sitting here and listening to me, you can look up who was this guy called Elon Musk again, just by thinking about him. The answer, including a nice picture of Mr. Musk, would instantly be displayed in front of you. With a quick thought command, you can share what you see and hear with a friend in Hong Kong who can participate as if he would be here with us. Or, if you happen to not like the talk at all, you can have a thought conversation with your neighbor about what you had for lunch. None of this would require any effort. It would feel as natural and intuitive as thinking is. Does that sound great or terrible? Or maybe not so different from what we do today? Maybe you feel like that scenario is just some wild science fiction. But I guarantee you, it is not as off the grid as it might seem. Today, tech companies and scientists all around the world work on the development of technologies that cross a new frontier, the frontier of our skin. It is very likely that during our lifetime, some of us are going to integrate some technological device into our heads. There are two basic ingredients that we would need to make such a device. The first one is all about perception. We would have to turn our eyes into displays in order to melt our perception of the outside world, our front yard, the metro station, with our virtual world our Facebook and our email account. This blending of the two worlds we live in is called augmented reality. Already today, you can buy glasses like Microsoft's HoloLens that do exactly that. They display some text information or some funny, colorful arrows into your visual field that help you, say, install a washing machine in your home. In the future, instead of using these kind of nasty glasses, the display could be integrated into an elegant contact lens that is implanted into the eye. Currently, Google, Samsung and Sony are working on the development of smart lenses that project images on the eye or that allow you to make photos using eye movements. Let's have a look at the second ingredient. When we use our phone in daily life, we do not only want to perceive information on it, but we want to interact with that information. We want to scroll through pages, search things in the web, send messages. To do that, we use our thumbs on the screen. Would it be possible to do the same thing using our thoughts? There is no such device that looks at your brain and recognizes that you think, damn it, I forgot Peter's birthday today, call him now. But what is possible is to recognize basic building blocks of your thoughts. For example, we can say, given the activity in your brain, there is a 74% chance that you are thinking about the letter B right now. The technique to do that is called brain-computer interface, and it is applied mainly for paralyzed patients that can use the interface to communicate with the outside world without moving at all. Using their thoughts, they can write or control a cursor on a computer screen. In order to do that, however, they have to wear a cab with electrodes on their head, they need to be wired to a computer, and the set of things that they can actually do with it is pretty limited. So it is not really practical to use for everyone in everyday life. But there is a bunch of research going on that tries to make the same technology applicable for healthy people and to integrate it into the body. Last year, Silicon Valley superstar Elon Musk founded a new company. 
It seems like he got bored by building spaceships and electric cars, and now he wants to build a device that is implanted into the brain and that makes healthy people do things with their thoughts. The idea is simple. The implementation is ridiculously complicated because much of how the human brain encodes information is still a mystery. But this moment, here and now, is not the peak of technology. Scary things are about to crawl out of Silicon Valley. And the most scary thing is, because these things happen in little digestible steps, rather than in one revolutionary leap of development, they will probably feel normal as we go. So let's try and keep a critical distance. Here we are. If we could combine a brain-computer interface with augmented reality, implant them into our eyes and brain, and wirelessly connect them to a computer, we would have the magic done. We would have a smartphone integrated into our head. It is not at all off the grid to wonder about that scenario. So, here comes the important part of the question. Do we want to melt with technology? Do we want to become cyborgs with magical abilities? My first intuitive answer to that question was, hell no! I love to climb mountains. I love to dive in the ocean. I love to have conversations with people made of flesh and blood. I get depressed by spending the whole day in front of a computer screen, and I feel like already today I depend on technology far too much, and I certainly do not want it to enter my last resort, my natural body. But then I thought about it again, and does it really matter if the technology I use is located inside my pocket or inside my head? Technology is a crucial part of how I interact with the world. I use my smartphone for communication, for orientation, to store memories on it. I outsource a part of my thinking to it. In that sense, my smartphone is a part of me. I already am a cyborg. Implanting the same functions I use today into my head just represents a more direct form of access to them. If we are so afraid of what technology will do to us once it is located inside of our body, we should also be concerned about what it does to us today. Why do we feel like we get lost in a virtual world at times? I believe this happens simply because very often we use technology in an unhealthy way. If you cannot have a conversation with your friends without checking the messages on your phone every five minutes, that's not the fault of WhatsApp. If you feel like your understanding of what goes on in the world becomes more and more superficial, that's not the fault of media. And if you cannot find the way to your grandma's place on your own, even though you drove there for a million times, that's not the fault of Google Maps. If you feel like any of the ways you use technology is not doing you good, then it's up to you to change it. Train yourself. Communicate digitally, but be able to put your phone away when you want to immerse in a real-life conversation. Focus on some comprehensive articles instead of getting distracted by random headlines of trashy news. Use Google Maps once, and next time try to find the way from your own memory. Technology is not good or bad. It is a powerful tool that is at our disposal. And there are better ways to make use of it and worse ones. It's up to you to judge. I found a powerful criterion that works for myself. I want to use technology only in a way that enables me to dive deeper in the real world. What do I mean by that? Earlier this year, I spent some time traveling in Brazil, which was a mind-opening experience. My phone helped me to share this experience. It helped me to find couch-surfing hosts, Brazilians made of flesh and blood, who welcomed me at their homes. 
It's enabled me to join hippie communities in the middle of the jungle, planting cacao and banana trees. Thanks to different language learning apps, I taught myself Portuguese so I could discuss everything from Brazilian politics to Carpuinha recipes with anyone I met. If I use it in the right way, my phone becomes a vehicle to immerse myself in the world in ways that my grandma wouldn't even dream about. Playing Candy Crush, on the other hand, does certainly not fulfill that criterion of connecting me to the world. It sets me apart from it. When we take technology to the next level and melt our bodies with it, a whole bunch of new options how to interact will pop up. In the newer technology universe, there are wild speculations going on about thought communication, about virtually beaming yourself to another part of the world, about moving things in your environment with your brain. No one knows which of these options will become true, let alone when they will become true. But what is certain is that a multitude of very difficult ethical issues would arise. If we wire our brains to the internet, how will that change social interactions? How can we make sure that Mark Zuckerberg doesn't track everything we do and think? What does privacy even mean in such a world? Ask these questions to any tech guru in Silicon Valley, and with a fancy soy latte in his hand, he will swipe your ethical concerns away with his one killer argument. Hey, look, he will tell you. Every new technology in the history of humanity had good sides and bad sides, and people always worried. But would you want to go back to 1852 riding around in a stupid carriage? No? Well, then, here we go. Let me wire your brain to a computer now. But this is not a good argument. We cannot just project what happened in the past to the future. We have to deal with the issues. Google and Facebook are not intrinsically evil, but it lies in their very nature to be driven by economic motives rather than by idealistic ones. Let us not leave the stage to them when it comes to designing our future, because that is simply not their task. It is our task. If we don't want to live in the technological utopia that the CEOs in San Francisco are dreaming of, we better have a counter-concept. How do we want technology to shape our future? In order to answer this question, we must leave our role as naive consumers behind. We have to pick, out of the pool of possible technological tools, those that enable us to do things better, those that connect us to the world and don't set us apart from it. We need public discussion about the ethics behind the hot new ideas. And building on that discussion, we can create political organizations that can control the growing power of tech companies. They can make laws that guarantee that we as users always stay in full control, that there's always the option to turn off the phone in your head. They can set financial incentives to create non-abusive technologies, technologies that serve society and that do not disrupt it. Because why would anyone create a non-abusive technology if you can make much more money with an abusive one? That is what we should work on. But most importantly, let us not be so emotional about the whole topic. We shouldn't be afraid of technological progress per se, but we shouldn't follow it with blind enthusiasm either. Neither of these is a constructive attitude. Let us make a conscious choice as individuals, as we choose how to consume technology every day, and as society, as we go about designing our future. I am looking forward to immerse myself in the world in ways that I cannot even conceive of today. And one day, I might implant a smartphone into my head. It does sound scary, but I believe once we found solutions for our concerns, this might enrich my being in the world. I will still be human, or say as human as I am today. What about you? Thank you. <laughs>